filter farms have less outbreaks of PERS uh, than non-filter farms, right? The other thing that I learned is, you know, farms that are located in, in remote places or in less dense areas, less swine dense areas, have less outbreaks. So I think these two things are, are, are facts, are not longer uh, um, theories, are facts. So, so there's some sort of component. I don't know if air transmission is, is the way here or I don't know if any other factor. But I would say that, you know, area spread is, is a thing. Swine it. Hello, welcome to our latest edition of Swine It Podcast. I'm Jerry Purvis, your host, and today we have a special guest, Dr. Carles Villalta. Uh, Dr. Villalta, uh, welcome to our podcast today. Well, uh, hello, Jerry, and uh, thank you for the invitation of participating in, in this uh, podcast because it's, it is very well known and I think you're doing a great job like doing a uh, diffusion of work and research that has been doing around the world. Very good. Well, let's... Uh, before we get started, maybe uh, listeners, uh, tell us a little bit. I know you've been a, a researcher, a, a swine vet, uh, epidemiologist, and, and so maybe just tell, take a few minutes to tell us a little bit about yourself. Yeah, I'm a veterinarian by training, and uh, my main interest when I was studying was were, were pigs. And this is where I started. I started as a swine veterinarian. Uh, I work in... in in different companies, in different positions, um, and with the goal of under- trying to understand the swine industry from all points of view, or at least from the most uh, point of views possible, because I think that it helps you to to, to take you know better decisions, uh, no matter where you where your position in the swine industry. So you know, being that I I work in those companies, and one of the, in those companies, my my work was was. Um, I was dealing with clinical trials, and that you know triggered my interest in 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 uh, learning more about science and how to make better decisions, uh, at least in selecting the products that you're using in the farm. But that you know, I, I further developed that into a PhD. I uh, studied a PhD in pharmacology, uh, focusing on on the uses of antimicrobials and, and uh, in respiratory diseases, and more specifically. Uh, Bacillus pneumoniae and uh, Glacerella parasuis now, uh, former known as Haemophilus parasuis, uh, in order to not develop antibiotic resistances in you know in those two pathogens after after a treatment. You know after I completed my PhD and I was you know working at the same time that I was doing my PhD in the slaughterhouse as a meat inspector. Um, well, I applied for a position because I wanted to to learn a little bit more of experience in, internationally, and I ended up in in the University of Minnesota working with Bob Morrison, with Monsetor Remorel, and with many others um, that John Dean, that uh, are I think are reference in the worldwide industry, where my job there was to be part or work in, in the epidemiology of, of uh, swine diseases, more sp- uh, specifically and a uh, special focus of PERS in the Swine Health Monitoring Project. Uh, you know, once after four years, uh, we decided to come back with my family to Spain and uh, I started as a consultant. I worked a couple of years as a consultant uh, trying to help, you know, um, the industry or, or companies around the swine industry to extract more value of their information or their data and after that you know i got offered a position here at, at this institution research institution which is called the irta cresa uh, in the area of epidemiology and purse research explore meta farms for all your livestock production data needs experience our integrated software platform offering complete operational visibility from breed to market utilize customizable dashboards for data analysis and benchmarking MetaFarms mobile apps enable offline access, maximizing efficiency and enhancing profitability. Visit us today at MetaFarms. Very good. I mean, it, it's um, it seems that as we look today uh, at the industry across every you know the globe, uh, health is a big challenge, and uh, I'm always interested to talk to someone. Uh, 
that's got insights, you know, to diseases because that, you know, obviously that's our biggest challenge. If we if we've got good if we got good health, we generally got a good chance of having good performance. But uh, if we have poor health, you know, it doesn't matter how good our husbandry or uh, our skills are, we're going we're going to suffer and we're not going to have good performance. So. Um, you've studied, it's been your focus, uh, diseases, uh, you looked at specific diseases, um, uh, PERS, I know, we, uh, ASF, I guess let's take PERS. That, that's probably cost our industry, what, north of what, 650, um, million dollars a year. Uh, what, what is, uh, what are some of the things that you've learned, uh, particularly about PERS that, uh, that can maybe help. That I, I agree with you in the sense that um, swine health is going to be important. Um, I think we we need to improve the health of the herds, especially it, maybe this is the European scenario, but um, we're, we're, we're being restricted the use of antimicrobials. And I think it, it's, it's going to be really, really important to keep a good health of the herd. So... You know, we need to maybe invest in different tools, maybe, you know, ventilation, uh, environment, heat, uh, other tools rather than, than antimicrobials, because that is, is you know, it, I think it's a trend and it's, it's going to be the future. The, the antimicrobials are going to be more and more restricted in, in the, you know, swine production, but other, other types of production. You know, having said that, uh, and regarding PERS, I, I, one of the things that I learned is, is the virus has been uh, living with us for, for a long time. And, and this always is shocking me because, um, you know, I don't, cons- you know, the, I consider that there are, or, or I have met very bright people and very smart people and, and they could not, you know, figure out how to get rid of this, of this virus, right? We, we have you know, we have created vaccines from many other pathogens and and we have applied, you know, measures for other pathogens. But uh, this this pathogen, I think it's, it's, it's complicated and it's teaching us every day uh, that we might have, you know, a lack of biosecurity, that we, we have not controlled this, um, you know, and, and we have to be, you know, constantly reviewing our biosecurity. We have to, you know, be always aware that the, the, this virus can enter our farm. And I think this is one of the things that uh, I learned from this pathogen, uh, that it, you know, it's always keeping you on your toes uh, regarding biosecurity. 100% agree. You know, that's, uh, that's an area, and that's a good topic. I want to spend a few minutes there getting your take on, on biosecurity and maybe, you know, what are the area, what are the things that we're missing, you know, in our, in our plans and, uh, and maybe what are some of the things that uh, we focus on that uh, maybe is not really mitigating that risk, and maybe some things that we're, we're, we're we should be focusing more on. You talk a few minutes just about uh, biosecurity in general. Well, in general, I think it's it's you know it's um, it's better to have uh, a good biosecurity, and we we you know let's start with the basics. You need a fence, and you you know especially in in Europe because of of uh, wildlife. But then, more specifically, you need a changing room where you know shower in, shower out. Uh, I mean, the, all the classics. I'm not. I don't want to repeat myself. I think every, you know all the listeners here know what a good biosecurity is. But uh, again, to me, what is surprising is even though with farms with this you know high level biosecurity, the virus make makes makes its way to to the pigs, right? And some, sometimes you think that this virus. Uh, so, like, it's some sort of uh, smart being waiting outside, outside of the farm, you know, trying to find, you know, where, where your weakness is. And I, I don't think that we're fully understanding, you know, how this virus moves sometimes and, and enters the farm. You know, one of, one of the things that data from the Swine Health Monitoring Program showed us is, I think it's, you cannot question that, that you know, that filter farms uh, have... You know, are are a good potential. Uh, actually, you know, the mm, filter farms have less outbreaks of pers uh, than non-filter farms, right? The other thing that I learned is, you know, farms that are located in in remote places or in less dense areas, less swine dense areas, have less outbreaks. 
So I think these two things are, are, are facts, are not longer uh, um, theories, are facts. So, so there's some sort of component. I don't know if air transmission is, is the way here or I don't know if any other factor. But I would say that, you know, area spread is, is a thing. Um, again, you know, biosecurity, when, when they put um, filtration, for example, in farms, they... they I, I like the concept of, of the package of biosecurity where I think I, I heard that from from somebody in, in, in Iowa Select Farms. And uh, I, I like that concept because you invest in, in many other things, not not only in filtration, you invest in, in you know making sure that everybody enters and, and goes out in the same in the same way. You make sure that the you know cadavers and dead animals are collected in a specific place and you clean it after that and, and you cannot open the door one door if you don't close the other because you, you you're on a, in a filtrated farm i think all of that i think it makes you know uh, a filtrated farm more more secure in a sense but maybe you know it's not just filtration maybe it's it's more things that that you you have in that in that specific farm that is helping to keep the virus out. Another interest of mine, and this is an interest of mine, uh, is is uh, the manure movement. Um, I think for for so many years this has been a, a, a thought that practitioners and farmers had on 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 their back of their heads. Um, you know because it it it. It, it matches perfectly, you know, when you move the manure and when the measure of outbreaks uh, um, happen. And I think that that is a lesson, not, not specifically about PERS, but um, we, we move manure, which is an organic fluid. Uh, we move the manure around, which we spread it in, in many different ways. No, maybe not a spread, but, but, but you put it in, in fields around some other farms that... Um, and that, to me, is a biosecurity threat, not only for birds, but also, you know, for other pathogens that could be digestive pathogens like like uh, dysenteria or, or or any other any other pathogen. And I think, you know, we have to think a little bit more. And, and I don't know how to control that, but we, we need to think, you know, where are we putting the manure of one farm? Is it close to any other farm? Uh, is it going to be a threat? Is it too close? Is it too far? Uh, Right, and then you know we have all these tractors and trailers moving around, and, and uh, you know the, the the roads sometimes are dirty, and, and other tractors and, and and trucks from other farms are, are just just driving the same roads. So I, in, in in overall, I would say you know the the things that I learned from Pers is is um, that area spread is important. Uh, I don't know which factor is going to be you know the most important of that, and then the second is. Manure is, is, I think, sometimes over overstated, over overlooked. We, we're not looking uh, in the way that we we should be looking at, at the movement of an organic matter. Yeah, I hundred percent agree. You know, the challenge for producers is is there's so many entryways, and and to your point, you know, maybe maybe there's some entryways that we don't are not really uh, controlling or really understanding, uh, and so the, these you know these are areas that uh, it's going to get into our farm if we're not paying close attention. And uh, so 100% agree, you know, it's uh, biosecurity plans are only as good as, as the practice. And, you know, a good point you made there, uh, I think here in the U.S., we've seen farming more concentrated in areas, kind of what you mentioned in Spain. And so you're only as clean as your neighbor, you know, and, and if, you're, if you're close to an outbreak, you know, uh, you've got a really high risk of that outbreak uh, being transmitted to your farm. So I think that's another issue that's happened uh, is farming has become more concentrated. You don't have the, the luxury of space, you know, between farms uh, and they're just so close. So that's, that's a good point. You know, I don't know how much we can control that. And uh, it seems like that's probably going to get worse as we go forward. Plus um, also, let, let let me say that also you know the, the soil industry is very dynamic you have you know lots of movements of people uh, and vehicles and you, trucks tractors uh, cars it's it's very very dynamic so in a week you know you can have you know a lot lots of movements of the bigger the farm you know the higher the number of movements you, you will have so that you know it, it also increases the risk of entering any disease so true. Yeah, it's uh, 
it's just amazing how many entryways uh, if you if you log that that uh, you've got outside people coming in, you know, to your farm and and being able to control that. Uh, you know, uh, thinking a little bit, uh, you've done a lot of work here collecting data and, and and trying to figure out how we lessen the impact. Maybe talk a little bit. It seems we're taking a lot of data here. Uh, we've we've been able to uh, collect a lot of data. But uh, being able to interpret that data and, and use that to make decisions sometimes is uh, lagging a little behind. Maybe talk a little bit about uh, what you're working on as far as uh, using data to combat some of these spreads of uh, disease. Yeah, let me, let me start by, by, by telling you that, or, or the listeners, that one of the things that I learned from my experience in the U.S., and, and I really like the concept of uh, what I call um, Cooperative epidemiology or, or, or macroepidemiology. I really like the concept of, you know, different producers sharing information and using that information in an aggregated manner, you know, when you report it, but, but you know, behind the scenes you, you can see, you know, using confidentiality, of course, and, and, and protecting the information, but aggregating the data in a way that you can see patterns and you can see things and you can learn, you know, how this is moving. And this, I think this is an example of, you know, Swine Health Monitoring Project. Um, we were doing that and it's, it's continually doing that by monitoring specific diseases and it is, is, is learning, you know, how the diseases act. Um, other other initiatives in the U.S., I think, are, are doing that. I, for example, the SDRS in, in, in the Iowa State University, I think, those initiatives are great. In Spain, regarding PERS, there are certain initiatives uh, done here by the by, by producers, uh, collecting sequences, for example, and, and, and also learning that. But, for example, in, in, in the department of the IRTA Cresa, where, where we work, uh, we try to provide you know, the regional government with tools, better tools, um, to try to respond fast uh, against any threat uh, regarding ASF, well, I'm thinking ASF mostly because this is the, the, the closer threat that, that that we have here, and it's gonna it's gonna be, you know, our biggest our biggest threat. So regarding, you know, there's a number of data that is being collected every day. For example, movement of animals um, in Europe is mandatory that uh, the movement of animals because of traceability has to be collected. And this is centralized by the authorities. And uh, right now, you know, we have developed different tools in order to respond that, you know, one of the tools is a, is a radius, is a, an outbreak, outbreak um, situation that would be used in, in outbreaks, which is, uh, it, we create the maps and we create the radius um, for for the administration to act against, you know, this, if there's an outbreak and then we create the maps and we distribute the, the field sheets of sample size and everything based on the information that we have of the census of the farm or the capacity of the farm. And also we make the connection links between movement of animals in that specific area. Where do they came from or, or where do they go? So it's. I think it's very easy. This has changed in the in the in the last twenty years. Um, in the face, you know, when you were facing an outbreak of any reportable disease, I think in the past you used to do maps in in a room with a table and and, and trace the the circumferences with a comp, with a um, with these tools that that make uh, circles. And um, but right now you can do that very automatically. And I think we we are able to to create those. Or that information in less than you know in seconds in seconds that can be distributed with email to all the people that is is part of uh, the, the swine industry. Then we have created an, an, a risk analysis tool for ASF where you know based on all this information it, it can tell you know where if you had to look for an outbreak today where you should start. Um, it ranks the farm based on the risk. In different uh, types of entry, it, it takes into account also the biosecurity measures that the farm has, like the ones that you can measure. For example, if the if the farm has a fence or or if the farm has some some type of disinfection system, 
if the farm has a um, a changing room. So based on that, you know, these are mitigating effects. So uh, we're, we're, we we can provide like a risk number and then decide if we go to this farm to sample the farm. And, and lastly, we're working, we're currently working in, in trying to develop a syndromic uh, surveillance using rendering um, the, the rendering information that we have from the rendering companies to see, you know, there's a spike in mortality in, in especially in, in the farms that are importing pigs from the rest of Europe because that uh, obviously is, is is one of the threats that we might have, even though you know they are well well tested um, in the in the source and also when they arrive here in Spain. So you know this is the way that at least we're trying to to collect that information. Uh, that is already being resisted by the administration and, and try to extract you know more value out of it in order to help the swine industry. Yeah, I mean it's it's uh, the quicker you can you can isolate or or identify, and that seems this, this model is kind of a unique. It's a predictor, so you're trying to basically predict you know where an outbreak uh, is ha- could happen or where it's 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 already starting to you're, you're starting to develop. So they can quickly put some things in place. Okay. So, so you got this. You got a data, and you're trying to predict where an outbreak uh, is happening currently or uh, is about to happen. Uh, what do you? What are? What is the next steps that uh, that you do to keep that outbreak? What do you? What do you get the word out to producers, or uh, what are some things you put in place? So, I mean, it's, it's not up to me because you know that there's a, a legislation uh, and the administration, the administration is the responsible of that and, and, and I think they have contingency plans. Our mission here is to, to provide the tools and the information for the administration to take, you know, the, the, the right decisions and, and a quick decision. Um, Further than that, I, th- I would say that, you know, th- they should communicate with the veterinarians and, and everybody involved in, in that outbreak because I think it's, you know, communication, it's the, it's the best way um, that you can prevent, you know, that disease. You know, if we're talking for ASF, for example, you know, to, to spread out. And, and we, I think we have learned, you know, the poultry industry is a little bit, a little bit different, right? But um we had uh, an influenza outbreak last year here in one um, turkey farm. And I think in the way that the administration and the producers uh, manage, manage that outbreak, that specific outbreak, I think it's, it's the, I think it's, it should be the example that, you know, um, that we should use in the swine industry. I think they manage it very, very, very quickly in, in less than one week, you know, they had, you know, everything uh, under control. Um, and I think, you know, they, they quickly detected, they quickly reported it, they quickly put in place all the measures, um, calling and, and also testing and, uh, restriction of movements and everything. And, you know, in 28 days, because I think it's a period that you need to, to wait until everything is resolved, uh, but, but the situation was resolved very quickly and just one farm was infected. And I think that's a good good point. One hundred percent agree. You know, it's communication. I think I'm hearing communication is probably the key. Uh, and I think we do we do lag behind the, the poultry industry, um, and they seem to be more um, uh, able to deal, uh, communicate, get the word out, and deal with it and uh, isolate. And so they prevent spreads. Uh, so I think I think producers, our swine industry, we're a little hesitant sometimes to. Uh, to maybe talk about uh, or uh, you know admit that we've got a problem, and so that's that's an area where definitely we, we need some work on uh, here here in the United States. You know, uh, the non-reportable you know diseases uh, people are are hesitant to talk about it. Uh, and we know what a truck driver you know he drives down the road he's he's uh, he's infecting other farms and and before you know it it's just you know the spread is is uh, you can't contain it so. I think that's a good, good, good point. I agree. I think you know farmers and producers uh, should should share more, at least at least you know communicate more because I think it's, a, it's a still a stigma uh, having some sort of disease 
right? If you have some neighbors that they are also swine producers, I think it's some stigma to say, you know, I have this disease or the other disease. Um, but I think it's quite normal. We're working in this industry and, and what I think we need to understand that, you know, everybody is, is um, could, could have any type of, you know, disease because we are all under this uh, industry. I mean, you can get infected by any of those pathogens. So it's it's not something specifically from one farm. And especially, you know, with, with globalization and, and with movement of animals and, uh, uh, you know, everybody can can get infected. So I guess we're saying it's biosecurity, you know, then we got communication, you know, we got we to gotta, uh, do a better job of, of communicating and, and getting the word out and, and sharing, you know, when we have issues and, and uh and, and then we're able to make a map, you know, and, and be able to, to uh, get the word out and, and maybe put in some measures. Uh, just kind of shifting a little bit here, um, you know, not quite, uh, you know, ASF, of course, we don't have here in the U.S. Uh, and it's not in Spain, but uh, it, it's a very uh, pertinent topic here, you know, as, as we try to keep this, this uh, disease out of our, our borders. What are some of the things that um, of this disease that, that that has some challenges with it that may be more so than other diseases? Well, I think the, you know this this is this is create create a big fuss in all the countries that enters because it it it, it stops automatically the import. And um, for example, for us being a, an importer uh, an exporter sorry an exporter country, um, it would be it would be very problematic. Um, you know, we have measures of uh, bleeding animals that enter from from other places. I think that's uh, already a, a good measure. We still have, um, you know, a country which is France between our closest uh, outbreak. But I would say, you know, there are certain certain things that you cannot control. For example, the movement of people, and I think this this has been seen. In the in the at least in the last outbreaks that happened in Italy, that initiated like the the infection in Italy, in in Germany as well, in in Belgium and in in Sweden, um, you cannot control people. Uh, you can try to educate and you can put um, signs and, and posters and and repeat the message because I think it's it's very key that it's to to repeat keep repeating that, but. Um, uh, no, you cannot control people, and but you need to at least you know try to mitigate uh, the not the movement of people, but at least the risk of them bringing infected meat to to the country and tossing that meat, especially in forest areas. You know that's the the worry. You know that uh, you know a guy uh, a person could be in in an infected country could have you know get on an airplane could have some some product pork product. You know, show up somewhere, and and uh, I mean, it could be that easy. Uh, that that product's fed to an animal, or somehow, you know, gets into a trash dump or whatever, and a you know, a, a feral hog or whatever, and then here we go, we got it. So, it's really uh, it's really daunting to think about uh, how that easily that could happen. And uh, so, it, it it's. Uh, do you think you see more? Um, you know, it seems like uh, a lot of people we've geared up and uh, things that we put in place are working here in the U.S. I know that the, the government's put in some some good measures and it's, they seem to be working or we're just really lucky. I don't know uh, which is the maybe it's a little of both. But um, what do you think is the biggest risk for it for entering? Uh, you said imports. Um, you think it's going to be walked in? Imports is it's one of them because we're, we need any. Uh, we need um, Spain has a need to, from uh, piglets from other places to to raise here, so that we have imports of piglets coming here to 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 be finished here. Uh, that that is one of the risks, even though you know again they are very well controlled. They are bled in the source and they are bled. Then you know once they arrive at the farm here. Um, and uh, I'm sure that they, they will be followed because they are specifically a risk. Uh, movement of people, again, and wild boars, I would say that those are the three main main risks that we have currently because of ASF. Uh, 
And again, we are lucky as well, or we might be lucky because we have the Pyrenees, and that is a could be, as a natural barrier. Even though you know, I think there's, there's information that you know some wild boars can cross the Pyrenees, but at least you know it's not a plane that they can cross freely. They they you know it's going to take time for them to cross that natural barrier. Yeah, we got a lot of water separates us, so that's a, a pretty <laughs> a pretty good barrier for sure. So, but but your point about feral hogs, we 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 seem to have more and more uh, issues with feral hogs in our country. So, um, and they are very hard to control. Uh, it seems uh, that population, you know, pigs are pretty smart. We've tied different measures, trapping, and and uh, it's just really it's going it's just really tough to control. I think it's it's a uh, I would say it's a problem. It's a problem, at least in the in the swine producing countries, or at least in, in in the northern hemisphere countries. Some of them that they have, you know, feral hogs or, or, or wild boars, because you know they don't have a natural predator. Um, and pigs, you know, they 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 used to not to have, you know, a, a, a very small litters, a very small number of, of piglets. But because of the vietnamese at least in Spain, you know, we 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 have seen examples of people that had a vietnamese pig, and they they released in the nature, and and it got crossbred with with a wild boar, and now we can see that you know there's certain wild boars that they can have you know bigger bigger litters, and this increases also the the this you know the the, the way that this population it it grows and grows. And um, and then also you know if you, if you if you put that together with the fact that you know most of the people don't know that the, this problematic and they tend to feed the the this wild boar um, I think it 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 it's easy for these pigs to to find food right it's easy for these pigs to to um, to grow in numbers uh, and then if you put that together with the certain areas where they have forest and they have, you know, cover, uh, I think that's, that makes this a scenario where we can have, you know, areas with high density of wild boars. Right. So just, just thinking back what we were talking, uh, you know, people, it's hard to control people. That's a, that's definitely an entry route. Uh, but, uh, so what have people done to the biosecurity plans just for ASF? What are some of the changes, uh, you mentioned maybe barriers, um, shoring up the farm. Here, in in a sense, um, most of the farms will have a, a complete fence because it's 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 already mandatory to have a complete fence. It, it has been mandatory for a long time, and and you know it can be some farms that they still don't have the complete fence, but I mean there it's it's just a few, and then you know. Um, every time that they have an inspection, I think they they had a, a visual inspection if the fence is is has holes or, or you know it's broken. But um, most of the farms here, um, I would say ninety ninety something percent of the farms have a fence that can be closed and it and and, and it is closed, uh, so that prevents the you know wildlife from entering that that farm at least at least pigs. And the other the other thing that the swine industry does is is repeat the message of you know workers do not bring any pork uh, food or any pork uh, inside of the farm um, it might be allowed to eat it outside if you have um, separated um, offices but uh, it is recommended not to bring pork to the farm yeah so people people and then having barriers you know um we're, we're at feral pigs can't, aren't, don't have access into a farm, and then and then the people restricting you know what they bring into the farm and the, as far as food and with this disease one one of the things that can be seen that it, it behaves very differently than other diseases for example pers and and I think we're lucky about that uh, this virus does not transmit very well um, and if you can prevent these two if you can prevent wildlife to get you know uh, any 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 point near your 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 pigs. And if you can prevent like a contaminated meat from entering the farm, it's, I think it's I would say it's very easy to keep the disease out of the farm. Uh, you know, you you can have some other mistakes, right? But but with these two uh, ways of entry, uh, you, you probably you know your risk of, of getting one of these ASF is gonna be is gonna be very very low. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's it's interesting too as we um, 
we, we target certain diseases, but when we improve our biosecurity, we actually improve the transmission of other diseases that we that we fight. You know, it seemed like we had PED in 2014 in our area, and people got really serious about their biosecurity. And uh, you know, you had less flu, you had less PERS breaks, and uh, so it it, uh, it not only you know you target one disease, but uh, there's a lot of benefits you know for the for the animal's health if we if we put in some of these measures. You think we're as we get we get ready and we're we're fighting preventing ASF and uh, that you think people in general kind of you know we don't have anything we don't have anything happening or we don't have any spread here in the, in your country that people kind of after a while they kind of fall back into their old ways and and maybe don't don't uh, aren't as serious about their biosecurity. You find that in your area happens? Well, I think you know. Keep- Keep the stress of, of um, you know having having the biosecurity in in high levels and, and not making any mistake. I think it's very difficult. It's very challenging. Um, I think you know different people have have proven that maybe you know just by recording, for example, recording the movements of people and categorizing them as risky or non risky. I think it's you know it's very it's very hard to 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 be all you know always on guard. Against all the all the diseases, um, you know ASF. Again, we we don't have ASF here, and probably that is not in the in the mind of of, of producers. Uh, once you might have ASF around, I think that will will increase the, you know, everybody's awareness about how how we are doing things. But again, here in Spain, because of the production system that that we have, I would say I would say that you know we we already have good biosecurity, but. The, to me, you know, one of the problems is is how to transmit that or how to explain that to all the workers um, in a farm, so they you know they behave all in the same way and they don't do you know any any risky thing. Like for example, you know, if you have somebody that smokes, that, that maybe you know it can go out for smoking and without changing clothes or or, or opening a different door that is not the the, the one that you should use and i think that is the is the complicated thing is like to make everybody aware that um biosecurity is is you know you have to keep it every day you have to keep it every hour you 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 cannot relax in a sense and you have to create the habits of of doing certain things and not not you know not falling back to to all habits or or to easy ways of doing that um, I think that that is the complicated thing for me. Yeah, yeah, I agree. You know, and the other thing too is a lot of times uh, the practices they do, nobody's watching. You know, and it's really easy to to uh, you know if you don't really understand you know the risk, and maybe you do something, nobody's watching you, and uh, you don't think there's any accountability. So that's another tough thing. A lot of times we're, we're moving pigs and uh, you know moving animals, and nobody's watching. You know, so uh, pretty much it's, it's an honor system, you know, that you're doing what what you're supposed to be doing. So that's another tough area. Well, I think, you know, uh, these are some areas that uh, we just need to keep improving and uh, appreciate your work because that's, uh, you know, that's uh, as we learn more about these diseases and how they're transmitted, you know, we've, we've got a better chance of, of preventing that. And that's good for the whole industry, you know, if we can all share and, and good ideas and uh and learn more about how these these uh, more about these diseases, then we can uh, put in plans that we can maybe prevent that spread. We're not going to get away, uh, probably eradicate these things, but uh, at least we'll do a good job of keeping the incidences of uh, breaks down. So, no, and, and and again, I think this 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 ties back to to the you know where where we started the conversation that um, you know if you have probably good biosecurity and you have, uh, you know, if, you, if, you, if the workers know how, 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 know how can they apply like the, this good biosecurity and have, you know, good, good biosecurity measures and movements inside of the farm that would uh, link probably to better health because you're, you're going to do less risky things, especially for birds, because it's a disease that uh, I think it, it thrives on, on biosecurity mistakes. 
but uh, for other diseases, right? For move, you know, any other bacterial disease, if you move pigs in and you not not doing that in the right way, you you can make the disease spread and infect other animals. Yeah, very good. Yeah, very true. We're all you know the the farm. Uh, there's a big incentive for for good health. So uh, you know, if you don't have pigs, uh, you don't have production. That farm uh, financially is is not very. Good. So we, we, there's a good incentive for us to. For, the, for everybody to take note of uh, biosecurity and, and follow the practices. It's time for our famous three. An animal nutrition technology company offering innovative products and new applications for the swine industry. The combination of AB Vista enzymes, technical services, and nutrition expertise provides the industry with new opportunities to further improve production efficiencies. Fiber is receiving renewed interest due to its influence on the microbiome, and AB Vista has brought together research experts to discuss the industry's knowledge of fiber functionality and to introduce a stimbiotic targeted to improve fiber digestion. To request access, contact NAM at abvista.com. That's N-A-M at abvista.com. So... Very good. Well, we're at the end of uh, probably our podcast here, but uh, we always want to ask three questions to our guests. So I'm going to throw them at you. Uh, first one, what is your, uh, what's your favorite swine resource? My favorite swine resource? I, I, I'm not going to be very original here, but I would say this is a swine. This is a swine is a, is a, is a good resource. Is a great, actually a great, a great resource. And then, you know, my, my second would be PubMed. Um, Probably not not very applied, but I think you know sometimes that 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 scientific thought uh, you know I I always keep this thought that you know uh, everything has been described maybe you know and there's a lot lots of information that you know are in in scientific publications and maybe you know we don't have the time to read them or or to make the connections between between the the different ideas right so I would say diseases of swine because it's a very digested digested um, way of getting the information. But then, you know, if I want to dip a little bit farther, uh, I would say PubMed. Right. Very good. Uh, uh, next question. What's, what? Who was your most influ- influential person on your career? Probably if you had to name a person or persons, I sometimes it's... Yeah, I would say I have two. Yeah, mostly regarding swine industry. The first one was my my PhD advisor, which is uh, who is Lorenzo Fraile, who is a, also you know a PhD, but also was a swine veterinarian or is a swine veterinarian, even though that he worked in the university. Because um, I think he he gave me a great opportunity uh, of studying my PhD, and he was a great advisor, um, and uh, we still you know we have a, a very good friendship. And and the second person I would say Bob Morrison. Um, Bob Morrison, I I worked with him just for a year, and, and but we work very very close, and I really like it his style of uh, communicating and, and making you know work that matters, and, and and trying to find you know practical approaches to solve um, the problems that the swine industry has. I think those two to me are are the people that I'm I'm always you know thinking you know what would uh, Lorenzo Fraile or Bob Morrison do to solve this situation. Very good, very good. Yeah, it's always, uh, you know, that's a process uh, that, that a lot of people underestimate is just, just having the problem-solving skills, you know, and, and thinking about, thinking through, you know, challenges that we have and, uh, and how we go through that, that, that thought process. Lastly, what, what would you say uh, are some characteristics of successful people in, our, in the swine industry? I, I I would guess that uh, there's many many characteristics, but um, first of all, I think you have to have interest, and uh, you have to enjoy what what you're doing. I think those those two are, are the main ones. I, probably the you know the most important one is is to have to enjoying what you're doing, and then you know if you're enjoying what you're doing, interest and and all the questions will will come back will come will come to you. Um, I think if you're, you know, if if you're enjoying uh, the swine production, because I think swine production is is a, I would say it's a great science or it's a it's a great way of producing. It has 
you know, different different types of approach that could be the more mathematical because you're dealing with data, with information, you know, how many live-born piglets per year do you have in your farm or mortality or, or, or you know, you're looking at numbers basically uh, uh, if, if you're earning money or, or losing money. But then also it has this, this, this approach that I think veterinarians like, you know, that you, 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 you can, you can, have your hands dirty, like you know, if you have certain um, certain death, you can you can perform necropsies, you can take samples, and also y- you can put in practice your uh, problem solving skills, um, right? If you see a situation that it, it it's not good, you can you know let's see you know what what we're gonna do here, and I think it's very rewarding once you have um, selected the right option to see that everything goes back on track. Yeah, very true. I think, you know, that's the, that's the challenge. Every day is different in it, uh, in our industry. Uh, no days, no two days are the same. And, uh, you know, every problem is a little different. Uh, and so any new experience, you get these experiences, you learn, you know, how to use those experiences as you, as you find the other problems. So yeah, very, very true. I think, uh, very good characteristics having you know just being inquisitive you know and and and, and looking for we 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 think we there's a lot more to know about our industry for sure so very good i totally agree we we uh people gotta have you know you gotta love what you're doing and uh you wake up every day and and uh face today's challenges and uh and uh with a lot of gusto and and uh i think that's important you know, so, yeah. well, very good. Uh, well, well, Carlos, I, we appreciate you uh, coming on our show today, and uh, I'm sure sure the listeners, uh, there's a lot of things we can take from here, and uh, keep up the good work, and uh, keep uh, hopefully we'll we'll keep uh, fighting the health, and and maybe we'll we'll get to talk the corner and turn, and uh, you know ASF maybe we'll we'll keep that uh, keep it out of our borders, and uh, I'm 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 crossing my fingers that. Uh, the things that we're doing and, and, and the plans you've got, you know, if we have something, I feel comfortable that uh, all collectively we can, you know, work together and keep these risks uh, at a minimum. So well, thank, thanks. Thanks to you for the invitation. Uh, it's been my pleasure being here and sharing this time with you and having this conversation. I really, really enjoy it.